Tonight we're going to look at Acts chapter 16, uh, verses 25 through 40. And just a quick review in terms of where we are. We are on what we call Paul's second missionary journey uh, that began back in Acts chapter 15. And Philippi, which we're talking about in Acts chapter 16, is really the first major city and the first major events that take place on this missionary journey. So we fortunately are at the front end of this second missionary journey. Uh, just a quick review of where Paul has been and where he's going uh, from this map, and hopefully you can see this. Uh, Paul begins in Antioch of Syria. That's the home church. That's the sending church. And you may remember from the first part of Acts that the church in Jerusalem was the main church. Well, now that Paul is taking the gospel to the Gentiles, it's actually this church of Antioch of Syria uh, that's the main church. It's the one that keeps sending Paul out on all of these missionary journeys. And Paul ends up taking Silas with him. And we talked last week about how Barnabas and Paul had a falling out, and that's why uh, Silas now joins the team with Paul. Uh, they go through Tarsus, which happens to be Paul's hometown. Uh, then they end up in some churches that they had started on their first missionary journey, including the church at Lystra. And at Lystra, Timothy joins the team. So now Paul's team is growing. It's Silas, Timothy, and Paul who are now part of the team. Uh, they end up going to Troas. And once they reach Troas, a couple of things take place. Luke, who's the author of the book of Acts, joins the team uh, at Troas. And when you see the word we in the book of Acts, and you see that at the beginning of chapter 16, it's an indication that Luke is not only writing about what's happening, he's there. Uh, and one of the reasons we have four stories about what happens at Philippi is the fact that Luke was on the team uh, when all of those events took place. The second thing that happens is Paul isn't sure where to go from Troas. And he tries to go a couple places, and God keeps saying, no, that's not the direction I want you to go. And finally, Paul gets a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. And Paul says, that's a vision from God. We're going to Macedonia. And that's what they do. They cross the Aegean Sea, end up in Macedonia. The seaport town is Neapolis, and 10 miles away is Philippi. And that's where we pick up in chapter 16. They're in Philippi, which is part of Macedonia. There are four main stories in uh, chapter 16. There's the conversion of Lydia, and we talked about that last week. Uh, Lydia is a Gentile woman. Uh, she's a wealthy woman. She's a seller of purple goods, which back then purple was the color of royalty. And so you had to have a lot of money just to buy purple. So Lydia is quite wealthy, and she's Gentile, but she's interested in the Jewish faith, and she joins some Jewish women for prayer. And that's when Paul shows up and shares the message of Jesus, and Lydia becomes a believer in Jesus. And to demonstrate her faith, faith to show that she has real faith, she invites Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy to stay at her home. Uh, apparently she has the gift of hospitality. When the church is finally formed at Philippi, it will meet at the home of Lydia. The second story is the story of the demon-possessed girl. Uh, this was a servant girl owned by a couple of gentlemen who used her to make lots of money because this particular servant girl could tell people's fortunes. And people would pay a lot of money to hear their fortune. So these guys had a really cushy job. Uh, they just used this servant girl to tell people's fortunes, and they made a lot of money. Uh, this girl ends up following Paul around and basically telling what Paul did, that they are servants of the Most High God, teaching you the way of salvation, which was true. Uh, it's interesting how much demons know. And we talked last week about the fact that when Jesus encountered a demon, that demon knew exactly who Jesus was and often shouted it out uh, to the whole world to hear. And so this happens again, and day after day, this girl follows Paul around. And eventually Paul has had enough of it, 
So in the name of Jesus, he casts out the demon. And the demon goes. And when the demon goes, the money goes too. Because now these men who own this servant girl have just lost their cushy job. She's no longer able to tell anyone's fortune. And these guys get angry. They're very greedy. They live for money. And now they don't have money. So they end up accusing Paul and Silas of a lot of things, dragging them to the marketplace, the town square, where uh, criminal cases were heard. Uh, they accused them of being Jewish, which really wasn't a crime, but Philippi was an old Roman colony, not hardly any Jewish people there, so the Romans really didn't care for the Jews, so that was an issue. Uh, also, they accused them of starting a riot, which Paul didn't do. It was actually the owners of the servant girl who caused all the commotion. And then they accused them of living according to customs that are not acceptable to Romans. Uh, well, the Romans worshipped gods and goddesses, and Paul was preaching a message of Jesus, uh, somebody they did not know and did not understand. Well, Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. They should have been given a trial. But what we have in Acts chapter 16 is more like mob violence, where the crowd takes over and pretty soon things get out of control. So these owners of the servant girl basically convince the magistrates that Paul and Silas are guilty. Uh, so the magistrates, without giving them a trial, have them publicly flogged and thrown into prison which we're going to find out tonight is absolutely against Roman law if the ones you do that to happen to be Roman citizens. So at the end of verse 24, where we left off last week, Paul and Silas are in prison. They're in the innermost cell of the prison. Uh, that way they can't escape anywhere. Their feet are in stocks and they're chained to the wall. In other words, they're not going anywhere. Uh, or are they? And we left them there for a week. Actually, they were only there for one night. And we pick up tonight uh, with the story of the conversion of the jailer, and we begin with verse 25, where it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas, they're bruised, they're bloody, they're in pain, their feet are in stocks, they're in the innermost cell, they're chained to a wall, and they're praying and singing hymns. Interesting. We would expect them, instead of praying, and this praying is a prayer of praise, we would expect a prayer of complaint. You know, God, you called us to Macedonia. And now look what's happened. God, we faithfully followed you. We did exactly what you told us to do. And we went to Macedonia. We went to this town of Philippi. We proclaimed your message. We saw Lydia become a Christian. We cast out a demon. And look at our reward for serving you. We're in prison. We're in pain. This is terrible. God, why don't you do something? That's not what they said, but... Boy, I think a lot of people would have said that. They were actually singing hymns. Many people would have been singing the blues, but not them. They were praising God in singing hymns. I was thinking about our own situation. Dealing with the coronavirus, our country is in absolute chaos, our world is a mess, and a lot of people are complaining and griping, but we could, if we wanted to, praise God and sing hymns. You know, many people have said you don't always get to choose your circumstances, but you always get to choose your reaction to your circumstances. Paul and Silas could have had a pity party, but instead they have a praise party. They rejoice, they praise God, they thank God for what he's done. And this prayer is not even a prayer for deliverance, 
It's simply a prayer of praise to God for who He is. Many times we fall into discouragement and depression because we take our eyes off of who God really is. Uh, we get our eyes so stuck on our circumstances that we forget how big God really is. But not Paul and Silas. They decide in the middle of their pain, which they probably couldn't sleep anyways, they're just going to praise God and sing hymns. And that's what they do, and the other prisoners are listening to them, going, we've never heard this in a jail before. You know, most times people are cursing and shouting and, you know, saying all kinds of foul things, but these guys are singing and giving praises to their God. Uh, rather interesting. It's also interesting that when we do praise God, when we do decide we're going to have faith in God and trust Him even though circumstances are bad, often God does something. And this is no exception. In verse 26, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. God decides to send an earthquake. Now, Philippi was known for earthquakes and tremors, and this one just happened to show up at exactly the right moment. Uh, God sent an earthquake. And as a result, the prison doors flew open, which chances are there, were, there was a bar that was keeping the prison uh, door shut. The earthquake happened, the bars flew up in the air, and all of a sudden the doors were wide open. And the earthquake was such that the chains also came loose, Chances are they were chained to the wall, and they came loose, and all of a sudden, all the prisoners are free. And you would think, this is a good time to make a run for it. Uh, this is a time to scatter and get out of town before anybody notices. But that's not what happens. Beginning in verse 27, the focus now shifts to the jailer. Uh, he becomes the main character in this story. The jailer wakes up. And, you know, can you imagine waking up to an earthquake? Uh, that would be quite an experience. Uh, I happened to wake up this morning at 5 a.m. to a telephone call. And I first heard it on my telephone, and it eventually went to voicemail. And I was thinking, do I get up and answer it or just ignore it? But then my cell phone started ringing, and I'm thinking, I've got to answer that, because obviously something horrible has happened. It's probably one of you uh, calling me to tell me something, and I answer my cell phone, and it was our wonderful sheriff telling us that there was a lady with dementia who was missing, and apparently she lives in Sugar Mill Woods, where I do. So, and I was thinking, it's five in the morning. The odds of this woman breaking into my house and making her way to my bedroom are zero. <laughs> you know, why are you telling me this at five in the morning? I can't help you. So that was a horrible way to wake up. And well, this would have been a horrible way to wake up too. There was an earthquake. The jailer wakes up and he notices all the prison doors are open. And that's bad news for him. According to Roman custom, if you were the jailer or a guard, you were absolutely held responsible for all your prisoners. And if you let a prisoner go, uh, you would either be punished with their punishment or you would be executed. And so the jailer's thinking, I've lost all of my prisoners. Uh, who knows what's going to happen to me? The best thing that I can do now is simply draw my sword and kill myself, uh, giving myself uh, you know, an easy death compared to what I might face if I have to face the Roman authorities. So he's thinking, I'm dead, this is over, it's done. However, Paul shouts out, don't harm yourself, we're all here. There's a lot of speculation as to how Paul knew what this man was about to do, because it's dark. And the next verse says that the jailer asks for some light so he can see. Uh, it could be that there was some light where the jailer was. Paul may have seen him or seen a shadow. We're not sure. 
Uh, but Paul, knowing Roman custom, uh, sees this man draw his sword. He knows exactly what he's thinking. Uh, the man's going to kill himself. And Paul says, we're all here. And now we know that this story is not about Paul and Silas making a run for it. Uh, God did not send the earthquake so Paul and Silas could escape from jail and leave. Now, that would have been some interesting irony and justice after how Paul and Silas had been treated. Uh, the magistrates would then have to explain, you know, we let these two guys go, they've disappeared, there was an earthquake, and somehow they got loose and they're gone. Uh, you know, kind of a payback. But that's not going to be the issue in the story. The issue in the story is we're all here. Which, it doesn't tell us how many prisoners were in the prison. My question is, why didn't the other ones make a run for it? You know, I understand why Paul and Silas stayed, but why didn't the other prisoners, you know, who were probably Romans, you know, lived in Philippi or something, why didn't they just make a run for it? But apparently they don't. Uh, the jailer calls for the lights uh, so that now he can see. He wants proof that everybody is still there. Then he rushes in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Talk about irony. He's the jailer. Paul and Silas are criminals. Paul and Silas should be falling before him. But now the tables are turned. The jailer now realizes who are these guys? You know, are they magicians who have somehow brought about an earthquake so that they could be free? Uh, you know, it could be that these guys have some connections to the gods and goddesses, and somehow these guys are quite powerful, they're prestigious, and these guys, if they can, you know, cause an earthquake, they can cause great harm to me as well. So now this jailer is very fearful as to what might happen to him. Verse 30 says, He then brought them out, and he asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The word sirs is the Greek word kurios. And kurios can mean sir. It can also mean lord. So in many ways, he may be addressing them as lords. Meaning, uh, you guys are special. Are you magicians? Uh, do you have some kind of special relationship with the gods? Did the gods send you here? Are you on a special mission? Uh, obviously, you're very powerful uh, to be able to cause an earthquake. Or the gods caused the earthquake on your behalf. So what's going on here? And then he asked this question, what must I do to be saved? And in one sense, every Christian wishes every non-Christian would ask that question. <laughs> you know, because we can answer that question, and that's the question they need to be asking. Uh, but the question is, what exactly does the jailer mean by that question? And there's a couple of answers. Remember that the jailer is a Gentile. He worships gods and goddesses. He has no clue as to who the God of heaven is. He doesn't even know there is a God in heaven. He knows nothing of the story of Jesus, except for maybe he heard Paul while he's been in town. So in other words, you know, in ancient times, these were pagans. They knew nothing about God. And now he's asking the question, what must I do to be saved? In other words, what must I do to save my life? What do I need to do so you don't get back at me for what Philippi has done to you? He may be asking that question. But it could also be that he's asking this question in a very religious sense. Uh, we know from verse 17 that the demon had been yelling out that these are servants of the Most High God who are coming to show you the way of salvation. So the word salvation saved has been buzzing around in Philippi ever since Paul and Silas showed up. And so, he may have heard Paul give a message about the way of salvation. And now he's asking the question, what do I need to do to be saved? Uh, obviously, uh, there's an earthquake. All the prisoners are free. 
Nobody's running. Nobody's trying to escape. This is a very unusual circumstance. I know a higher power is involved in it somehow. So tell me, how do I connect with this higher power that you obviously know? He may be asking that question. And I memorized this verse as a child. Maybe you did too. It's one of the favorite uh, salvation Bible verses uh, in the New Testament. Uh, Paul and Silas reply, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. The word Lord is that same word kurios that the jail, jailer used in reference to Paul and Silas. And it could be that Paul and Silas are saying, if you want to be saved, uh, we're not the Lord. You need to believe in the true Lord. And the true Lord is Jesus. So if you want to be saved spiritually, you need to put your faith and trust in kurios, Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. Uh, not the gods and goddesses that you worship, not the emperor, and not us either. The true Lord is Jesus. And you need to put your faith and your trust in him. And if you do that, you will be saved. And your entire household can be saved as well. So this is one of those classic statements of faith. Uh, how do I become a Christian? I put my faith in the Lord Jesus. Recognizing who he is, I commit my life and my trust and my hope to him. Then in verse 32, it says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. Now, Luke does a summary at this point. Normally, Luke would record the speech that Paul would give to this man. But at this point, Luke decides not to record the speech, but to simply say, he spoke the word of the Lord to him. In other words, he explained the plan of salvation to him. He explained to the man who Jesus is and why he needs to put his faith in Jesus for his salvation. So that is Luke's uh, quick way of saying, Paul gave him a nice sermon in which he explained Jesus and explained to him how he could become a Christian. Now it also happens that this jailer's entire family shows up, which that's probably not uh, unusual. An earthquake has taken place. And if you wake up in the middle of the night with, a, with an earthquake happening, the first thought you're going to have is, is my family okay? So chances are this man's family wants to go find him. They know where he works. He works in the jail. Uh, so they come to the jail to find him to make sure he's okay. Uh, because that's what we do in a crisis. We want to know that all of our family members are okay. And that's what happens at this particular point. So Paul has an audience now to explain the gospel to not only the jailer, but to his entire family. And we're not told how many people were in the family. But back in the first century, your family uh, was, of course, your spouse, your children, any other relatives who were living with you, and any servants who happened to be living with you. So it could be quite a sizable group of people uh, who, that Paul now has an opportunity to explain the gospel to. In verses 33 and 34, there's proof that this man becomes a Christian. You know, it's interesting, when Lydia became a Christian, she became generous. She quit thinking just about herself, and she thought about the apostles. And she said to them, come live in my house while you're here. My house is your house. I'll take care of you. And that became, in essence, an evidence of her faith in Christ. You know, when Christ gives us salvation, something changes. And as you think about your own life, when you became a Christian, something 
changed in your life. And that something was evidence of the fact that you're truly a believer in Jesus Christ. If you become a Christian and nothing changes, did you really become a Christian? Well, this man, this jailer, becomes a Christian. He puts his faith in Jesus, and then he gives evidence of his faith. And he does that in three ways. The first way is, is that he washes their wounds. When Paul and Silas are sent to jail, their wounds are not washed. The jailer leaves them a bloody mess as he fastens their feet in the stocks and leaves them there for the night. He has no interest whatsoever in cleaning them up. But now that he's become a Christian, the first thing he decides to do is to clean up their wounds. And chances are in the courtyard there was water available, and he takes water and he cleans their wounds. Uh, evidence of his compassion. Uh, the man had no compassion before, but now that he's a believer in Christ, he has compassion. There's also this play on words with water, because the second thing that happens is the man and his entire family are baptized. So the man takes water to clean the wounds of Paul and Silas, and then Paul and Silas take water and baptize the jailer and his entire family. So the jailer washes, and, at the, and shortly thereafter he gets washed in the water of baptism. Another evidence that he's truly a Christian. Uh, he's willing to follow Christ in baptism and be identified with him. Then the third thing that he does is really surprising. He decides to bring Paul and Silas into his own house and to set a meal before them. The jailer takes two prisoners brings them to his own home and feeds them a meal out of his own supplies, his own money. Wow. Uh, it's quite possible that this jailer has the gift of hospitality, and he demonstrates it right away in how he treats Paul and Silas. He no longer treats them as criminals. They're now his brothers in Jesus Christ. Uh, they're now part of his family, his spiritual family. And what a change of heart that takes place overnight, literally, uh, that this man was able to do that. And now he believes in God. Before the jailer meets Paul and Silas, he believes in the gods and the goddesses. You know, Zeus, Jupiter, Dionysus, Aphrodite, you name all the gods and goddesses, that's what he worships. Now he believes that there's one God, the true God of heaven. And now he believes that the true God of heaven has sent his son, Jesus, to be the savior of the world, to die for sins and to rise again. Talk about a transformation. Perhaps this man all of his life in worshiping the gods and goddesses was thinking, there's something missing in all of that. My religion's really not fulfilling. It doesn't change my life. It hasn't really touched my heart. But once the man hears about the God of heaven and about Jesus, his life is completely changed. There's an incredible transformation that takes place. So he goes from worshiping statues to worshiping the God of heaven and his son, Jesus Christ the man experiences a total transformation. And so does Lydia when she becomes a Christian. But the owners of the slave girl who don't become Christians, they remain selfish, greedy, and living for money. What a contrast between the two. Uh, the owners of the slave girl are greedy. Lydia and the jailer become very generous once they become Christians. Well, the story doesn't end there. Paul still has to deal with the city magistrates. And that brings us to the very next morning in what takes place. 
in verse 35 says, When it was daylight, which back in ancient times, life began at daylight. Uh, they basically lived from sun up to sundown in terms of their business activities. So as soon as it was sun up, it was time to go to work and do your business. And the magistrates are there in the marketplace. They're in their place to do justice. And they've made a decision. They're going to send their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. So the magistrate. Basically, what crime has Paul and Silas committed? Well, really, not much of anything. Uh, there's really no higher court to send that case to. Paul and Silas have done nothing worthy of death. And from basically from what I read about ancient judicial systems, uh, if you, they caught you in a crime, they did basically one of two things. They would flog you or they would execute you. Well, they flogged them, but the magistrates figure that's really all we can do to these guys. Uh, we can't send them up to the higher court to have them executed because they really haven't done much of anything. So we've taught these guys a lesson. So let's just go get them out of jail and tell them to leave Philippi and not come back. And we'll be happy with that. So they send the officers with that message to the jailer. These officers may have been the same ones who carried out the flogging against Paul and Silas. So they're the ones who go to the jail with the order, release those two Jewish guys and send them on their way. The jailer then tells Paul, passing along the message, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. So the jailer's kind of excited. You know, hey, you guys get to go. You know, you're free. Uh, you don't have to stay here anymore. The magistrates are turning you loose, so go in peace. But then there's Paul's reaction. Paul says to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens, and they threw us into prison. Now, those words may not mean a whole lot to us, but back in the days of the Roman Empire, those words are incredibly important. If you were a Roman citizen, you had the right to a fair trial. You had the right to defend yourself. Back then, they didn't necessarily have attorneys. You defended yourself. And according to Roman law, they could not put you in prison, and they could not flog you or even put chains on you unless you were found guilty. In other words, Paul's civil rights were seriously violated. A crime has taken place. And Paul's not the one who did it. The magistrates are guilty of a crime because they had them beaten and thrown into prison as Roman citizens without a fair trial. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. Now the question becomes, why would Paul do that? Why doesn't he just quietly leave and call it a day? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that Paul wants everybody to know he's innocent. He's done nothing wrong. Paul is also thinking about the church. Eventually, Paul's going to leave. But the magistrates are going to stay. And if the magistrates are going to stay, maybe if Paul makes them come and escort him out, that they'll think twice about treating Christians the way they've treated Paul and Silas. These magistrates also know that Paul, if he wants to, he can press charges. He can go to a higher court and get these guys in a lot of trouble. But by choosing not to, Paul is saying to the magistrates, I'm not going to get you in trouble. So leave these other people alone who believe the way I do. 
So it's a way of earning their favor. It's a way of doing them a favor, and they can do Paul a favor. Uh, because Paul's thinking not just about himself. He's thinking about the church that's going to grow up in Philippi. The office, officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They knew they were in big trouble. Because if Paul does press charges, these guys could get removed from office. They could lose their job. They could lose their status. Philippi, remember, is a Roman colony. It has a lot of rights. If the magistrates are not exercising their rights properly, Rome could take away some of those rights. And one of those rights was they were free from taxation. So Rome may decide that since you violated the rights of other Roman citizens, you're going to pay taxes from now on. And that's not going to set very well with the people who live there. So they had good reason to be alarmed. And so they came to appease them. It's interesting, things have now flipped. The magistrates are now the lawbreakers, and Paul's in the place of authority. When the magistrates were in authority, and Paul and Silas supposedly were the criminals, the lawbreakers, they treated them horribly. They treated them like animals. But Paul's not going to get even. He's not going to seek out revenge. Instead, he's simply going to have them escort them from the prison. Paul's not going to press charges. Paul's going to let it go. He's not going to try to even the score. And he's not going to do that for the sake of the church. That these guys will remember that those two missionaries could have gotten us in trouble but they chose not to. And then they requested them to leave the city. According to Roman law, if you're a Roman citizen, you cannot be forced out of a city unless you have committed a crime. And since they really can't pinpoint the crime that Paul and Silas have committed, they can't forcibly throw Paul and Silas out of the city. They can ask them to leave, but they cannot make them leave. And as it turns out, Paul is willing to leave, but he's really not in so much of a hurry. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters. So at this point, it appears that the church is growing in Philippi. It's not just Lydia. It's not just the jailer and his family. Apparently, others in Philippi are becoming Christians. And they're meeting for church at Lydia's home. And so that's where Paul and Silas go. They want to encourage the believers before they leave. And then they left. It appears that Paul, Silas, and Timothy all leave. There's a good possibility Luke stays. Because after this story, those we sections in the book of Acts, uh, we don't hear about those anymore until chapter 20. The we sections pick up again in chapter 20. And where is Luke in chapter 20? He's in Philippi. So there's a possibility he stays there uh, to help encourage the church, to help Lydia and others organize the church and get the church started. So, amazing things take place. Something horrible took place. Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown into jail. But God brought something good out of something horrible. And doesn't he do that often? You know, many times in our lives, something horrible happens. We go, God, why did this happen? But then we find that God brings something good out of something horrible. Oh, this, the horribleness remains, but God brought something good out of that. A jailer and his entire family 
become believers in Jesus Christ. And if Paul and Silas had not been thrown into the jail, they may have never met the jailer. God took something horrible and brought something good out of it. God can do that too today. As we look at the virus situation, as we look at what's going on in our country and in our world, we can pray, God, this is horrible, but you can bring something good out of it. You can bring something out of this that's going to bring people to faith in Christ. And we pray that he does exactly that. Well, next week we will pick up the story. Paul and Silas and Timothy leave uh, Philippi, and eventually they'll end up in Thessalonica. So if you want to read chapter 17 in advance, you can do that. Let me close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're such a wonderful God, that we can praise you, and we should praise you, even when things are not going our way. Because God, even in bad circumstances, you can do something good. You can do something wonderful. You can do something supernatural. So Father, may we always keep our focus on you. May our circumstances not get us down, but may our faith and our hope always look to you. Because when we look to you, that's when you come through. That's when you do incredible things in our life. So Father, teach us to have joy even in the middle of hard times. And people were wondering, you know, why are you joyful in the middle of a pandemic? Because my faith is in Christ. Because Christ is on the throne. Because Christ is in control. And my faith is in Him. Father, may that be true of our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.